Recently, I did a vlog on a property that we flipped here in Birmingham and made quite a substantial profit. And I got a number of messages asking, how do you flip houses? So in this video, I wanna share with you the three key stages when it comes to this strategy. If you're watching my videos for the first time, my name is Saj Hussain, and on this channel I have three videos a week to ultimately help you get further faster in your property investing journey. When it comes to the strategy of flipping houses, there's three key stages that we need to think about. The very first one is finding the property and acquiring it. The second stage is during this time we're holding the property whilst we're adding value. And the third and final stage is exiting out of the transaction. But when we're doing this, the most important thing to start with is the end in mind. So what do I mean by that? The whole purpose of this strategy is to come out the other end with a profit, and that's where we want to start. If getting a good return is the ultimate objective, then what amount of profit is really worth your effort? Well, this will vary from person to person. We all look for a different return. We have different strategies that we use, how much money we invest, whose money it is. Often people talk about a percentage. Some people talk about a cash return. So for example, when you're doing developments, it might be 25 to 30% profit that we're looking on on that particular project. And some people might talk about they're quite happy making 10 or 15,000 pounds from flipping a house. However, when I'm looking at these deals, what I do, I work with other investors, other investors will fund the deals. So we've got their cash in the deal and I'm looking to get a return for them and for me. So I tend to aim for a 20% cash on cash return. What that means is if we're making 20% profit on that money and if my investor's earning say 10% of that, then they're very happy because these deals don't take that long, only a few months generally to turn around and I'm making a very good return as well. This strategy is about acquiring assets, adding value and selling it on. So where do you find the funds from to do a deal like this? Because you need the money to be able to buy the property in the first place. There's a few different options. One is you might have your own cash. Often that isn't the case. Or you can use bridging or bank finance or mortgages, these type of strategies. And then the third one, the one I prefer to use, as I mentioned earlier, is using other people's money. So it's other investors that are funding the deal. That may be the form of a joint venture, or it may even be that they're just lending you money for that particular transaction. Now, if you want to learn more about using other people's money for property investing, make sure you check out the video I've done on this recently. We'll put a link in the description below. And if you're enjoying this content, then make sure you smash that like button, subscribe to the channel, and also enable the notification bell so you're notified when we're releasing videos just like this. Let's now talk about the first of the three stages. The first stage is finding the deals. But before we set about doing that, we need to think about and consider there's two key ways that we're going to profit from the deal. The first is when we buy our property, we make money on day one. That's because we can buy below market value and you lock in your profit in the way of equity. The second method is by adding value to that property, by making it much more valuable than it already is. They're the two key ways we're gonna make money from this particular strategy. So when we're looking for deals and we're finding these types of properties, what we have to bear in mind is how are they gonna fit in? Are they already below market value? Can we add value? Or ideally, can we do both of those things within the same strategy? When we look for these properties, there's two ways we can do that. One is we go direct to the marketplace where the property is already advertised. For example, the main portals, your Rightmove, Zooplus, etc. Your agents are all advertising on there or what we call on-market property. And also properties that, for example, going to the auction. These are all on market, they're available, everybody can see them. They've been out in the public domain. The other way is to go direct to the vendors and find the property before it hits the market or find the property that may already be on the market but you're in a conversation direct with the vendor because you can get more information, maybe able to structure the deal in a way that's gonna work better. Those are the two key ways when it comes to looking for these deals. What is it then that we're looking for in the deal? As I said, we've got to understand what the market value is so we can determine whether something is below market value. If someone says to you, this property is worth 100,000 pounds, you can have it for 80,000 pounds. You think, great, that's 20% discount. That's below market value. However, your job is to do the due diligence and check, 
is it actually worth £100,000 so that you're getting a discount or is it actually only worth £82,000 and you're getting a £2,000 discount? So doing that due diligence and understanding the market value is absolutely key. When we're doing this at the same time, we've got to think about what's the ceiling price in that particular area in terms of what we're going to be able to achieve with that value, with that particular property. Being realistic in what the end value of that property will be is really important because that will be the starting point when we're putting this particular transaction together. Let's say, for example, it's £150,000 is what you believe the end value will be. And let's say you need to spend £30,000 on that property. That means there's £120,000 left. Maybe it's a £20,000 profit you want, which means the maximum you can pay is £100,000. That's a great way in being able to calculate what the property is worth. Just because somebody's asking for a certain amount or just because somebody tells you the property is cheap, you cannot just accept that. You have to do your own due diligence and this is the best way to do that. You establish the true end value that you'll be able to achieve, what costs you're going to have, what profit margin you want to build into it and what ultimately you can pay for the, uh, for the property. When looking at auction properties, sometimes people get a little bit carried away when it comes to this. The assumption is you're going to get a bargain. And that's because people maybe watch too much TV and they think that's where all the bargains are. The reality is these are run in such a way that the only really people that are making money is those that sell at the auction. Sometimes there's some bargains to be had, but generally speaking in this market right now, when it's so active and it's buoyant, um, for example, in Birmingham, you'll see properties at the auctions, often with a guide price of 30, 40, 50,000 pounds. And then they end up selling for about £200,000 at the auction. And you think, what's the connection between those two numbers? Well, there isn't. It's just a way of enticing people into the auction room, getting them excited, creating a buzz around that particular property when it's really going to achieve what it's worth and what somebody's prepared to pay for it. But if you've done your numbers and you've calculated what it's worth to you, you stick to what it is you're prepared to pay for that particular property. Now, when you're dealing with agents, agents will obviously working for the seller of the property. Their job is to get the best price for the seller. You want to get the best price for you. And you've got to balance having a relationship with the agent and being uh, reasonable and nice with them with ultimately being able to be firm about what's a deal and what isn't. Because there's times I've had conversations with agents. They said, oh, Saj, I've got a deal for you. Let's have a look. And we look at it, we crunch your numbers and I say, Where's the deal? Because there's no deal here. These numbers don't work. Oh, no, no, I'm sure we can make this work. You could probably make a profit on it because they're just unrealistic about the numbers involved. So doing your numbers thoroughly is really important in making this a success. Let's assume now that you found the property, you've purchased it, and let's move on to stage two. Stage two is the value add bit. So you've acquired it, now how are we going to add value? There's two key ways that we can add value to a property. One is to reconfigure the space that's already there to make it work much better. The other one is to increase the volume of the property, for example, with extensions. So with volume, you may have, for example, a dormer extension in an attic. You might have a side story extension, or even a two story extension. You might have an extension to rear the property. You might have a basement conversion. All of these are adding extra volume to the property that may not already exist. But when you're reconfiguring space, reconfiguring space may be, for instance, let's say you've got an integral garage in the property. Uh, it's already inside the house and what you do, you utilize that space and turn it into a room. You could take an attic space that's already there, maybe as loft space, and you convert that into usable space without building out. So what you're doing, you're utilizing what's already there. So for instance, on uh, occasions, I've taken a three bedroom house with an upstairs bathroom and we've moved the bathroom into a smaller space upstairs by taking some space out from one of the larger bedrooms. And that means then we end up with four bedrooms upstairs as well as a bathroom just by reconfiguring that space. And often people may take a studio apartment and turn it into a one bedroom apartment. Again, you're reconfiguring space and these things can add value to what it is that you're already doing. But when we are adding value, we need to also bear in mind what's the limit in terms of where we can go to. So for instance, if you're adding a swimming pool, that might be amazing. You think it's going to be significantly worth more desirable, some gold taps in the bathrooms, but there's going to be a ceiling price and a limit in terms of what you can achieve with that particular property, or sometimes we call it the street value. 
Now you may occasionally be able to break past that, but you've got to be mindful that you are trying to push past that price. So if you can determine that price and aim towards it and build your profit margin to it, that's what we need to do. So for each pound you're spending, you need to think about how much value is this adding? And of course, the classic ones are like kitchens and bathrooms. They add significant value, adding another bedroom. These are things that usually add quite a lot of value to a property versus how much you have to spend pound for pound. So for instance, a conservatory might make it look nice, might make it more desirable. It's probably not gonna even give you back the money that you spend on that particular property. Make sure you watch all the way to the end because I'm gonna share with you the three biggest mistakes that are made when it comes to flipping properties. In my recent vlog where I was talking about a property which we flipped, we bought it BMV, so we bought it below market value, not massively, slightly, and we've done a substantial uplift in value because we understood what the ceiling prices were in that area and that street, and what we could take it to and change it to. And this is an example where we're combining both the below market value and value add, and also understanding what the ceiling price is. Of course, what we started with was really pushing that ceiling price, pushing past it, just to see if we could get it, because the market's buoyant, because there's no harm in trying to achieve that. Once you've done the value add and you've got the uh, the house the way you want it, you've taken it from what it was to what you want it to be, the next and the final stage is being able to exit out of it and selling the property. This is generally where we'd involve the estate agents in terms of selling that property for us. And when choosing an estate agent, people generally just pick three agents and say, let's get a valuation. But what I found in my experience, what works really well is rather than getting three agents, you get several agents around. Maybe give 45 minute appointment slots. So usually I pick about a week or 10 days ahead and I'd say, this is the day I'm gonna be at the property. Can you arrange for somebody to come and have a look at the property and value it uh, for us to get it ready to sell uh, and have that property uh, get onto the market? So when they come out, they know it's ready to sell and I'm given a 45 minute slot and I can have all the appointments back to back. The reason for getting several agents out is because I want to get a broad spectrum of what the view and what the opinion is because you'll get the occasional one which will be way way more than you think and you'll get one which will be way way lower than you think and you'll get a bulk one which will be probably where your research was and where you think it will be. And during this uh, meeting or interview of agents, if you like, what I tend to do is ask questions about their local experience, their understanding of the market right now, where it is, how many viewings they're getting, how quickly things are selling. Because remember, the agent's goal at this stage is to get your property listed. So, you know, sometimes they might just tell you what you want to hear. So you've got to kind of see beyond that and be able to work out what it is ultimately that is factual information that's going to help you determine who's going to best serve you in terms of selling that property. Then once I've picked an agent, I tend to go for a very short contract. What I mean by a short contract is some agents will sign you up for like 26 weeks. Why 26 weeks? It doesn't take 26 weeks to find a buyer for your property. Unfortunately, some, uh, let's say, unscrupulous agents will use a tactic where they'll give you a very high price at the beginning in terms of value and they say, yes, we'll be able to achieve this for you, Mr. Hussain. We can get that property straight onto the market, no problem, we've got buyers waiting. And it may be after a few weeks, they say, well, you know, things have changed a little bit. It's not quite achieving the interest we thought it was gonna be. Let's bring that property price down a little bit. Let's see if that helps. So ultimately what they've done, they've got you in at a high price to hook you in, they've locked you into a contract and now they've brought the price back down. Personally, I think that's a, a very unethical way of doing business, but unfortunately it happens all the time. So you have to make sure you don't fall into these traps. So you pick a price which is realistic, which is achievable, and also depending on how much time you have. For instance, if you wanna try and test the market the highest possible price, it may be you need some patience and think, okay, this might take a little bit longer because we're gonna try it at a high price first. Or it may be that actually you just wanna get this done relatively quickly, so you're going for a much more realistic price that's gonna create a flurry of interest. So there's different tactics that you can use. Obviously with COVID and things right now, things have been very different to how they were before. Agents would often get people down together, so it creates a social proof. There are lots of people looking at, the, uh, looking at that particular property. So you've picked your agent, you've got a short contract about six weeks and it's really important you keep a very close eye on what's happening and you keep on top of the agent because what they should be doing is reporting back how many people are viewing, what kind of feedback they're getting because really most of that interest is going to be in the first few weeks. If you've got a property on the market for eight weeks or so and you haven't had a buyer, really something's gone wrong. And generally speaking, it's the price. The price is way off, and so you've lost the interest. And what you don't want to do is allow a property to become stale. 
it's really important that you get that right, you're on top of it and you can readdress it and make sure you adjust if you need to, to get the property deal done. Once that price has been agreed and you find a buyer and the offer's accepted, the next thing you need to do is make sure you're on the case for the agent, uh, the, uh, also with the solicitor to get that transaction through all the way to completion. One of the reasons we need to make sure that we keep on top of the solicitors and the agents uh, in the transactions is because unfortunately it's very common for one in three deals to fall out of bed in this country. So when a purchase is being made, there's a third of those deals that actually never reach completion. And you don't want to be one of those stats. Often the very good agents, they'll have contract chasers and what their role is to make sure everyone's got the information they need, they're on top of everybody, keeping everything moving along and getting it across the line. That's really important. Another quick thing to share with you is a mistake that I made earlier on when I was selling houses. I never used to consider the outside space. So what the property necessarily looks like from the outside, yes, we might fit new windows and clean it up and at the back, just clear up the back garden or the yard. But actually, I've realized over time, this makes a big difference. Firstly, it's the first impression somebody has when they turn up at the property. And also in the garden, although you know you might leave it clean and tidy, but ultimately you wanna show how it's gonna be usable. So now we spend much more time and effort and also some money making sure the outside spaces are much more appealing. So those are the three stages. Let's now talk about the cost that we would need to consider at each of those stages. So at the beginning, when we're purchasing the property, what we need to think about is what costs are we gonna incur? So one of the costs will be the solicitor's cost for the purchase that we're doing. We also have uh, the mortgage broker's costs uh, in terms of a broker fee. We might have mortgage product costs, valuation uh, fees, and also stamp duty as well. So these are things that we need to consider in terms of upfront costs. And of course, if a transaction unfortunately does fall out of bed, you'll have what's called abortive costs. Abortive costs are things that you're gonna incur anyway in terms of costs. For instance, you might have already paid the surveyor, the solicitor might have done the searches. You know, all these things are lost costs and can't be reused somewhere else. Now, during the time of the acquisition, once you've acquired the property, what costs are we gonna have there? Well, we have what I call holding costs, and those holding costs might be your monthly mortgage payment um, or bridging payment. You'll have council tax, gas, electric, water, all these things you still need to pay for even though the property is empty. And often people forget about these little costs, but they all add up depending on how long you hold the property for. Then when it comes to exiting the property, what costs do we have there? Well, we've got the solicitor's costs again, so we need to pay the solicitor to prepare the contract for the sale, which generally will be less than when you're purchasing a property in terms of legal fees. And also you'll have the estate agent and their fees will vary from you know, maybe a thousand pound up to 3%, depending on what it is. It really depends on where you are in the country, what the typical rates are there. And there isn't a standard, so you have to consider what costs are there. And of course, you'll still have holding costs while you're exiting out of the property. Uh, as well. I need to make sure that the property is being kept clean and maintained in good order. Uh, for example, if a roof tile came off or the grass needs cutting, all these things are still done during the time until the completion happens. If you're doing this for the very first time and you don't own any property, then my suggestion would be start off by purchasing your home, move into it, and then when you sell that property, you don't actually have to pay any tax. There's no capital gains tax because it's considered your principal private residence. What that means is any profit you make on a home, you don't actually have to pay any tax on that, which is great. Now you can't do this repeatedly uh, because really then you're trading property, but also if your intention is to flip the property straight from the offset, then this really isn't the right thing to do as well. However, if you purchase that property, it's great experience for you in terms of renovating, adding value. You may source it BMV as well. You make it your home, you live in it, and then you decide to sell it and decide to move on. That's perfectly okay. You're making a profit from that sale and you're not gonna have to pay any tax. So before we finish, let's talk about the three mistakes that I see made in this particular strategy. The first biggest mistake is unrealistic values. Your expectations of what you think that property is gonna be worth at the end. It's really important that you are taking a fairly reserved approach about what you think that property is gonna be worth. The second mistake is being unrealistic about how long actually the project's gonna take. And it's not unusual for the projects to take longer. Sometimes it could just be delays beyond your control. For example, it might be you found something uh, in the property that means that's delayed you, you have to work around that. So there can be delays in the project. 
The third one is being unrealistic around the cost, how much things are actually gonna cost to do that. So projects often take longer and cost more because people have not really considered what's involved. So with the cost, you need to have some contingency as well. For instance, uh, during the refurb project, it might be you found some rotten joists, which you couldn't see and nobody could have foreseen that that's a problem. It's only when you start dismantling it, you start stripping the property out, you find these sort of problems and now you have to rectify and deal with these as well and this adds to your cost. So they're the three big mistakes. If you want to learn more about these in more detail, I'm quite happy to do a video on that. Make sure you pop a comment in the comment section below. If enough people ask, we'll definitely do a video in much more detail on that so you can avoid making mistakes like that. So make sure you uh, like the video if you've enjoyed what you've seen so far. Subscribe to the channel as well and enable that notification bell. And then I look forward to seeing you again on the next video.